Thanks. Um, and sorry to anyone who's trying to join in with Evo. That just snowballed into a disaster. But it, at least uh, <laughs> at least those of us in the, in the room can get this. I hope. Um, okay. Um, yeah. So let's see. I'm, I'm actually yeah my I, I, my real job is at Penn State. I'm actually hanging out here on on sabbatical through uh, midsummer or so. And um, and I wanted to talk about you know s some some of the stuff that's been going on lately and some of the new stuff I'm doing. Um, this is based on the, the 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 title I'm starting to think is a good generic name for a talk. This is based on some propaganda I wrote up at, at Lego's request for this Astro 2010 decadal survey. All the neat things we could do with gravitational waves and uh, observing neutron stars in a whole new way, especially if we get help from real astronomers. And astrophysicists, you know, people who collect photons for a living, um, that that helps us do a lot more. Uh, neat <coughs> but um, the, I, I, I said, I, I think I said in the abstract, you know, I, I was, was going to talk about all, you know, all, all this great stuff we could do long range. But every time <coughs> I start writing one of these talks, I get more and more focused on the stuff that we can actually do in the next few years, or the stuff that we need to do in the next few years, because there's there's a bunch of neat stuff happening sooner than we thought. And there, there's there's also a lot of work going on to to prepare for all the long range goals of doing new, uh, gravitational wave observations and neutron stars. Um, I'm also let's see there we go um, yeah so so there, there's there's an awful lot of different ways that neutron stars ought to be showing up uh, for gravitational wave searches and the one thing. You know, there, there, there's a lot of different astrophysical targets we're looking for. Binary mergers are the ones that everybody talks about. Um, neutron stars with other neutron stars, or neutron stars with black holes. And then there's continuous waves, magnetar flares, pulsar glitches, supernova and core collapse, you know, over, sort of overlapping with the birth of magnetars, and, and maybe even other stuff you could talk about. And this is really neat because it, it ties into a lot of really complicated phys physics. Um, uh, through surprising channels, just about everything going on in a neutron star could, in principle, show up in gravitational waves at some point. Even stuff as esoteric as you know viscosity coupling through electroweak interactions, that that can actually matter at some point. Um, there's there's way too much to, to actually talk about in a whole lot of detail. So I'm going to talk about a couple things here. I'm going to talk about magnetar flares and continuous waves for several reasons. Um, first of all, there's the usual lazy reason that that's the stuff that I've been working on mostly for the last couple of years, and partly because I'm a bit of, con of a contrarian, and everybody's always talking about binary mergers, which is great. The binary mergers are the one thing that we're really guaranteed to see, and, and even have a pretty decent event rate, and the guarantee is strong enough that if we don't see those, that'll actually be far more interesting than if we do, because it'll, it'll mean you know, a whole everything we think we know about compact objects is wrong, that level of certainty. Whereas these guys have more question marks. Um, strictly speaking, you know, it's it, it's it, it's not entirely clear by orders of magnitude what sort of event rates or gravitational wave strains you're going to get out of continuous waves and magnetar flares. But the way I think of that is that's an opportunity. There's a lot more question marks with these guys. So there's more more uh, chances for observations to tell us something that we didn't already know. And um, the, related to the fact that there's more question marks, there is some possibility that we could actually see these things even with. Uh, the sensitivity of LIGO data that's in the can, and we're starting to get into the era where Virgo data uh, can also be competitive, and um, and and to me that that's that that's kind of more interesting at the moment than than thinking about stuff that we we could do in five or six years uh, when we're already not not taking full advantage of squeezing every bit out of the data we got. So I, I'll, I'll I'll talk mostly about I'll, I'll talk about these two sources of gravitational waves, and I'll I'll talk mostly about things that are sort of interesting in, in the, the, the present or very near future. I will go back and, and talk a little bit about what hopes for advanced LIGO with continuous waves towards the end, though. Um, let's see, so uh, let me switch these around, actually, and talk about magnetar flares before I talk about continuous waves. So the magnetar flares, that came up as sort of a lucky thing. It, was, it wasn't really on um, LIGO's initial menu back in the days when I was a student here in the, you know, early 90s, people were writing the proposal and all that. Um, th that um, that's because people started learning more about these things. Um, there, there's, a, there's a couple of cl uh, classes of objects um, in, in astronomer uh, 
jargon, uh, SGRs is soft gamma repeaters and AXPs is anomalous X-ray pulsars. Um, the, the, to make a long story short, um, there's this is actually a little bit, little bit out of date. There's about 10 dots on this map. There's you know closer to 20 now if you combine all of these guys. Um, there's there's they're, they're uh, fairly young neutron stars. They tend to live in the galactic plane, except for this one, which is actually in the uh, large Magellanic cloud. And and these look like these are highly magnetized neutron stars. The most interesting thing is, is um, the SGR version of these things. Um, soft gamma ray here means these things have these gamma ray flares, um, really big gamma ray flares every so often. Um, how big? Um, well, if, if, if you go into the statistics of all the flares people have looked at, um, it, it looks like, you know, if you plot a histogram of flare, flare size versus the rate, it looks like these things are distributed with the Gutenberg-Richter power law, which is the sort of power law that you see um, for earthquakes, for example, yes, it's that Richter, the guy who was here and did the, did the earthquake scale. Um, and there's other stuff. Actually, also, if you look at the waiting times, it looks like earthquakes. And there are a bunch of people, including a, a guy, Jay Maynard, at, at Penn State, who did all sorts of lab experiments, carefully putting things in a vise and breaking them. And, and this is universal sort of brittle fracture behavior. Um, so there, there's, there's, uh, there's that and, and a lot of other things that have led a lot of people to believe um, with some skepticism in the early 1990s when Duncan and Thompson started proposing this, um, but more and more belief nowadays that what's going on in these things is there's a very strong external field from the spin downs of these neutron stars. It should be on the order of 10 to the 14 up to 10 to the 15 Gauss, and you could argue it's even stronger inside. That's going to be sort of um, twisted up as these things are born in supernovae, and the twists are going to be sort of gradually propagating out of the crust and twisting the crust around, and you get little flares sometimes, and occasionally really big flares going all the way up to 10 to the 44 ergs, or that was the story up to 2004, and that was a nice fit. Um, I remember it, in the uh, almost exactly 12 years ago, as I was finishing up my thesis here, um, Roger Blanford was, was asking me about something else, which I'll come back to, and the maximum elastic energy in there, and you know it's a order 10 to the 44 ergs. Um, Roger was thinking of that in the context of, of something something completely else. But it, you know it was, it was a nice nice story that that that, that fit well. Um, if these are coming from magnetic fields twisting the crust until it breaks, you would expect um, this power law distribution and then this maximum energy. But then uh, something very wacky and very fun happened in 2004. There was a giant giant flare, more like 10 to the 46 ergs let off instead of 10 to the 44 ergs. And that was too much for the total elastic energy of, some, of a normal neutron star across the strain to the breaking point. I was, um, well, I, actually, I was looking at something completely different for continuous waves, which I'll come back to. But I, I happened to submit this paper on um, the, 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 the crust elastic energy goes like a volume integral of the shear modulus times the strain squared. And you push the strain up to the maximum strain, the dimensionless number. You, you push things around until the crystal lattice breaks. The shear modulus is ergs per centimeter cubed. Basically, how much how, you know how, how much uh, energy per centimeter cubed does it take to make a unit deformation of this thing? And I was figuring out for various reasons I'll get back to that for quark matter, you could get the shear modulus a thousand times bigger. So you could get 10 to the 47 ergs as your maximum elastic energy. And nowadays, um, last year. Um, Chuck Horowitz and Kai Gadow, um, a nuclear physicist and a solid state guy, molecular dynamics guy, did these really interesting simulations that said, you know, the breaking strain um, goes up. Um, so so it, it, by a factor of 10, it's quadratic in that. So even for a normal neutron star material, you could bring this up, up to 10 to the 46 ergs. Um, anyway, we're, you know, we're, 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 looking, we're looking at some um, uh, pretty serious energy is getting off, let off in gamma rays, and if that's tied into elastic energy of the crust being released, you can imagine that's going to pop the neutron star around and also emit gravitational waves. So, what is the dimensionless strain that they're proposing? The, the breaking strain that they're getting is 0.12, which basically is we, we're, we're, we were using 10 to the minus 2, and now it's 10 to the minus 1. In fact, the, the highest ones when they play around with this are about 0.12 which is precisely the ideal strain that you would see in textbooks going back for decades that nobody ever thought was going to happen. And the reason why that happens is very simple. Um, they, they did, um, they, you, 
the normal way things break is you make vacancies and they, they start piling together and make other vacancies and when the pressure is so big it's too expensive to make vacancies. And they did all kinds of games with this. They you know, drilled holes in their little initial data slab of stuff and they you know, do crazy things like you know, write your phone number in domain walls and imagine all kinds of weird stuff and it all gets crushed away. So that, that's pretty interesting for continuous waves too, which I'll, I'll come back to. Um, so, so the 2004 giant flare was kind of a surprise to everybody, and, um, and this was really you know, driven by Sabi Marco. We, we took advantage of it in LIGO, and, and I, got, I got sucked into it too. Um, there, there was, so there, there have been several LIGO searches so far. There was one just of the giant flare. Um, there were quasi-periodic oscillations in the X-ray. Uh, tail of the flare lasting for a couple of minutes, but those probably aren't such good gravitational wave radiators, so we'll skip on to the other things we've been looking at more recently. And um, Savi student Peter Kalmas started you know, spearheading these, um, who of course is here, here now as a postdoc. Um, th this one, we, we looked at the giant flare and the total of about a couple hundred of them, and instead of looking at QPO frequencies and time scales, th this was specifically looking for F modes, the fundamental modes of neutron stars, that um, should be really efficient gravitational wave radiators, because if you dump energy into them, their damping time scale through gravitational radiation is, a, is like a quarter of a second, roughly. And the frequencies are you know, a few kilohertz, um, so that the noise isn't as good there. So there was also an opportunistic search down in what's called the bucket in LIGO jargon, which is you know, around 100 or a couple hundred hertz where the noise is good. And then there was, so that, that was 200 flares done separately, and then the, the latest paper from last year um, was this uh, storm of you know, 30 or 40 um, events happening you know, within 30 or 40 seconds. Um, or no, it was, it, was, it was 30 or 40 seconds, 70 or 80, something like that. Flares, they were all much smaller, um, but they, they, they were close enough together that you could talk about combining them in, in the data analysis and gaining sensitivity. Um, and that, that was through something that's called stacking if you're up on like a data analysis techniques. Anyway, the numbers, the numbers that are coming out here are um, um, for, let's see, so this, this is from the 200 flare paper and this is from the stack, the stack paper on the storm. Um, the best energies, the best gravitational wave energy upper limits, and they are upper limits, there was no plausible detection. The best gravitational wave energy upper limits I'd like to draw your attention to are down here in the bucket. Those are 10 to the 45, 10 to the 46 ergs, which is comparable to the highest photon energy, energy you see emitted in some of these flares. Although, if you go up to kilohertz for F modes, it's, it's not as good. It's 10 to the 48, 10 to the 49 ergs. And there's a similar story here, um, F modes versus stuff down in, in the bucket. Um, so th there's a bunch of interesting sort of theory and theory slash observational questions associated with the magnetar flares. The main one you want to know, the one that we were arguing about like when we were deciding in LIGO where do we submit these papers, for instance, is what's the maximum gravitational wave energy you could get out of these things? And the, the going rate, the, the going number is, that we're quoting is 10 to the 49 ergs, and that's actually not from that um, crust cracking thing that is the standard thing that people talk about. That's from this, um, you know, if, if you go and search the literature and there's surprisingly little of it, um, get cracking people, um, you know, I think this is a great opportunity. Um, th this guy, um, Kunihito Yoka, who showed up at Penn State for a while as a postdoc eventually, by the way, um, he, he, he came up with 10 to the 49 ergs. Um, that's, this is from his paper over here. This is a graph of various energy levels, not worrying about the dynamics of the flare, but just how can you come up with a ladder of energy states and look at the gap between them. He, 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 was, he, he found that um, if you, you think instead of what could deform a star, um, if you think of magnetic tension, magnetic field lines, if you wrap them around tightly in the interior of the star, kind of act like steel wires, and they can squeeze the thing and change its shape. And that means instead of the magnetic potential energy, which is four orders of magnitude smaller than the gravitational potential energy, you have access to the whole gravitational potential energy. You're changing the shape of the star, so you can get much higher energies out. And you're also, um, in, instead of maybe just popping off some stuff in the crust, which is less dense than the average of the neutron star, you're messing around, you know, if you have some reconnection event, uh, changing these magnetic field configurations down in the core, then you're, you're going to have to have the highly dense stuff down in the core moving around really fast to adapt, and that's good for gravitational radiation. And to make a long story short, um, I'm just edging close to 
finishing something with Alessandra Corsi, we, we went back and looked at that more carefully. Um, th this number is actually coming from something really crazy, even by the standards of crazy when you try and come up with crazy high numbers to compare to that initial LIGO sensitivity. But it, it actually, with this model, it looks like he got roughly the right maximum energy, kind of for the wrong reasons. Um, you know, look, looking at very, very soft equations of state, but it, basically we can put reasonable but sort of different uh, boundary conditions on how the magnetic field changes and still come up with these really big 10 to the 49 or numbers, which tell you that initial LIGO is starting to edge in to interesting territory with these searches. But, but there, isn't that the total magnetic energy? I mean, that star can only do that once. This is, this is, well, that's the thing. The, the 10 to the 49 ergs, if the internal field's in order of magnitude <coughs> stronger than external, 10 to the 16 gas, yeah, 10 to the 49 ergs is the total magnetic potential energy. But the key point, the key thing that's neat here is it lets you feed off the gravitational potential energy, which is a lot bigger. So you could do it maybe 10 to 100 times during the star's lifetime without, without uh, you know, Getting rid of getting rid of the whole field, so you're not limited to just one. Um, so that that that's one of the really neat things about this model. It's also very hard. Well, th th there's a lot of other weird stuff about that um, that I, I, I'd love to, to talk about afterwards. And, um, and well, we 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 ought, we ought to sit down and talk about this anyway. I'll be here for a while. Um, but yeah. The, 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 this is a neat lever, you know, a 10 to the fourth lever arm for the relatively small magnetic potential, magnetic field with its 10 to the 49 ergs potential energy to grab onto the 10 to the 53 ergs available in gravitational potential energy, moving high density stuff around. Um, so what we had to look at, um, um, some of us who were, you know, P P uh, Peter and Sabi and I and Kip Cannon, who's also here, um, we, we had to work out some things to do this stack storm search where we where we were combining or stacking these thir you know uh, 30 or 40 seconds worth of uh, rapid fire flares and we had to ask and at least come up with hand wavy answers to a bunch of questions like um, are the gravitational wave and electromagnetic energies correlated or are they not correlated if you go back on this slide you'll see there's a fluence weighted stacking and a flat stacking. That's basically coming down to di different upper limits for different assumptions. You know, do we weight the gravitational wave bursts by the electromagnetic energy or not? We assume they're uncorrelated and weight them all equally. You could even maybe imagine anti-correlated. Like, it's a rare thing, but there was at least one case. Um, but, you know, uh, Mazitz and, and a bunch of co-workers in the 1990s saw this thing which, you know, came out with like uh, 10 to the 42 ergs total energy, but there was never a gamma ray flare. There was this soft x-ray heating up for a bit and then vanishing in a few minutes, so it sort of looked like there was a subterranean flare. Maybe some of these things pop deep inside, and they don't give off much gamma rays, but they do give off gravitational waves. And there's all sorts of stuff about the time scales and, you know, are there delays or drifting funny things happening that you need to at least have some answer for. We gave very hand-wavy answers, and really, as far as I'm concerned, the, the main purpose of this of this methods paper was just to point out that these are interesting questions for people who really know what they're doing to go and try and work out better. Um, for example, what is their maximum gravitational wave to electromagnetic energy ratio in a flare? Um, that is something that you know, Chris John Ott um, uh, listened to, and he, he's working now. Now that now that Peter is here, um, they're they're working working on a bunch of stuff related to that. Um, there's also um, well, in principle, if, if, if we measure one of these things, um, we get the fundamental mode of frequency. That's going to tell us basically the mean density to order of a percent accuracy. That's pretty neat, but there's a bunch of other you know, questions to you know, try and really nail down that number. People, the last time people looked at this relatively hard was a decade ago when there were no observations and they were leaving out some practical things. There's also a lot of funny stuff that can happen when you consider how the fundamental mode, the thing that's radiating gravitational waves really well, is coupled, you know, maybe in very strange ways with driftings and avoiding crossings and stuff till the, the other stuff related to magnetic fields and threading the core of the star. And the, the one person who's really sort of thought of and, and published about this at some level of seriousness is Yuri Levin. And, um, you know, unfortunately, you know, a lot of people are not basically picking up on what he did, but he was asking very interesting questions. Um, and, and there's a lot more. So, Hoping people who are not connected with LIGO at all will will start um, uh, you know, start looking more at this. Um, okay, so anyway, uh, quick 
um, that, that was the magnetar flares, that's the quick one. Um, continuous waves then, um, long lasting gravitational radiation um, is going to be, uh, just, just by a little bit I guess, the majority of this talk, because um, there, there's a lot of stuff here. Um, basically we're looking at rapidly rotating neutron stars, not magnetars, and you, know, you need to have some kind of asymmetry on a rotating star to sustain something for a long time, comparable to the observation times of the data runs. And that means you're, you know, if you put together uh, you know, the LIGO bucket frequency of a couple hundred hertz, that tells you you're looking at something like 10 to the 10 cycles per year. So it's a horrendous data analysis challenge to try and find these things, because mesh filtering tells you, you know, things, things go haywire if you slip by a cycle. Um, but on the other hand, if we do detect one of these things, we can measure something to a part in 10 to the 9, 10 to the 10, and we, we can tell a lot of interesting stuff. For example, the all-sky surveys, which I won't actually be talking about from now on, um, the all-sky surveys for continuous wave sources could tell us um, a, a pretty handy uh, position on something if we do detect it, and people can go out and look at it with telescopes. We're hoping they do that. Um, to maintain the asymmetry, I'll go over a couple things related to mountains. You can hold them up through elastic forces, the normal things we think of as mountains. And then there's various things with magnetic fields. There's a couple varieties on the inside and the outside of the neutron star. And then there's normal modes, the R modes. So the first thing you want to know about mountains, um, going, going back to theory stuff, is um, how big could they be? Um, so for elastic mountains, there's actually a bunch of stuff on this going back to uh, 1970 or so, people will, were spurred by the first pulsar observations and pulsar glitch observations in particular, saying, okay, a neutron star has got to have part of it solid, and, and you can, they, they thought that mountains appearing and disappearing, cracking away were sort of a glitch mechanism, although that's tricky. Um, this, the standard number in recent years, um, if you look at a standard neutron star, um, uh, the maximum ellipticity so this is basically a quadrupole moment divided by the moment of inertia, or you know, it's the difference between the equatorial and polar radii, or it's sort of you know, delta R over R, you know, fra fractional, fractional number. Um, the maximum they were looking at was a few times 10 to the minus seven. If you were assuming you know, the usual breaking strain we worked with in the old days, 10 to the minus two, and th that's fairly low because you're looking at a thin crust, which is fairly low density compared to the rest of the star, the, she the shear modulus, the thing that you're interested in to see how tough this stuff is, and ergs, and, and, and so on, is, uh, you know, it, it, it scales as some power of the density, some positive power of the density. So th this, this was a pretty wimpy number. And then with LIGO observations coming up, I started asking about what, are, what, about, what about these other very strange things that people have postulated at the core, nuclear and particle physics-wise. Some of these things have lots of solid stuff at high density, and they would talk here and there in these papers going back a long time about maybe this is related to glitches and maybe you can release a lot of energy, but nobody ever tried to calculate. So, so I started looking at numbers. Um, the, the most robust sort of models you could look at are mixed phase stars. Um, the, these were, so Norman Glendening came up with the, an, an argument in the early 1990s that um, you know, we, we know at nuclear density you get nucleons, and at asymptotically high density um, you get uh, quarks, um, asymptotic freedom and all that, um, but somewhere between infinitely high density and nuclear density is the, the, you know, the core density of a neutron star. That, you know, the average density of a neutron star is something like two or three times nuclear density, and depending what model you look at, the core density is something like you know, maybe seven or eight. Um, <clears throat> So does wacky stuff happen in that range or not? Um, regard, regardless of a lot of unknowns, Glendening came up with an argument that no matter how it happens, the phase transition from baryons to quarks, possibly going through other funny stuff along the way, happens gradually, and when you look at it macroscopically, it looks like a crystalline solid. So something up to you know half, like half the volume of the star or more, and it's pretty dense, so you could get an ellipticity maximum, you know, something like 30 times higher, 10 to the minus five, and that was my number from a few years back. It looks like it's even almost an order of magnitude and underestimate. I've got a student looking at that in more detail now. But the really wacky numbers, um, if you look at quark stars, at the time there was this phenomenological model coming out of Peking University. Nowadays, um, you can also look at this more respectable thing from you know, Frank Wolchuk and Rod, uh, Roger Gopal about color superconductivity. Um, Basically, you get the whole star looking solid and at high density, so you could get up to a few times 10 to the minus 4, 10 to the minus 3, maybe even above 10 to the minus 3 ellipticity. And that was all with the old breaking strain, 
this number is linear in the breaking strain. So Horowitz and Cadell, we were just talking about, they knock the breaking strain from 10 to the minus 2 to 10 to the minus 1, um, with some caveats, which they are careful to spell out, but I won't be quite so careful. Um, the breaking strain, well, it looks pretty st it looks pretty reliable for the neutron star stuff, so now you can talk about a few times 10 to the minus 6 maximum ellipticity for that. For the wacky stuff, um, it's, you know, mi mixed phases of quarks, it's a bit less clear, but, um, well, we can hope. So anyway, you could get really high ellipticities, and it turns out these are interesting even for initial LIGO results, which I'll talk about momentarily. But first, let me go through um, the theory of something completely different for emission, um, continuous waves from normal modes. Now there's a whole zoo of modes of neutron stars. We mentioned the F modes a few slides back. Um, those are the fundamental acoustic modes of neutron stars. They're actually a sub subset of P modes, and then there's T modes, S modes, W modes, and the whole alphabet soup of them, but the ones we're most, in most interested for continuous waves are R modes. And these are subject to the Chandrasekhar Friedman Schutz instability, where gravitational wave emission, you know, you stir these things around, and this is roughly what an R mode looks like, by the way. It's this sort of, um, if you look at it globally, it's this sort of horizontal pinching pattern that moves around on the star. Horizontal, I mean, you know, it's not radial. It's locally, you know, moving, moving things around on equipotential surfaces. That's important because it means they emit gravitational waves in a funny way, and they also don't couple so much to viscosity. Um, and, they, and one of the funny ways is they're, they're always unstable, so the gravitational waves drive them instead of damping them until something funny and nonlinear happens. Um, so th there's a couple scenarios after a lot of work. Um, there's a couple scenarios that look survivable these days. Newborn neutron stars, um, if you really try and push it, talking to Ruxandra Bondurescu, um, you know, you, you could push it to maybe of order 10, 10 to 3 years, keep something living at low amplitude, um, even when you put in all of the funny effects of viscosity, which killed the other modes people looked at, that could be unstable to gravitational radiation. And you could also keep these things alive in accreting neutron stars, which is an attractive scenario for various reasons, uh, which I'll come back to at the end. Um, okay, so just a brief flash of what, um, what LIGO is looking at, and one of the things LIGO is looking at in terms of continuous waves is there's a search, um, it's um, just been accepted recently for APJ, here's the archive number, um, that there's a search for 116 known pulsars in the LIGO band. That's the most sensitive search for continuous waves in terms of the strain we can see because we know what we're looking for. It, you know, radio astronomers, for example, monitor the crab pulsar every day and tell us exactly how the frequency is wandering around and whatever it's doing. That helps us track these things much more sensitively than the all-sky surveys, where we lose almost an order of magnitude in strain, or two orders of magnitude in luminosity, what we can see. Um, this is just, um, it's a bit more than half of the known pulsars in the LIGO band. Um, it's not all of them because not all radio astronomers, not all, not all pulsars are monitored, and we're, we're trying to corral more radio astronomers into helping us out um, and you know, get this up to the 200 or so in the LIGO band. Anyway, um, you know, there, there are 116 dots if you can. This is an old search in red and the new search in blue, um, upper limits on all of them. Um, there's really, if you want to be really hard-nosed about it, there's one of them that's really interesting. And it's no surprise which one it is. Everybody's favorite pulsar is the crab, so why should LIGO be any different? Um, we, we actually have a couple papers on this now. We had, there was a LIGO paper in, uh, a couple of years ago now, and, um, uh, and, then, and then the crab is sort of the star of the show of this latest paper as well. Um, so that you know, the crab is something that you can look at and see how it's pulsing, and also see some other stuff going on in the nebulosity around it. Um, and so um, we, c we can say it's interesting because we can beat the spin down limits. So if you, if you observe this thing flicking on and off in the middle, um, which it does in all kinds of electromagnetic wave bands, um, you, you can track the frequency and the frequency derivative, and you know roughly the distance to this thing in the, the moment of inertia, so you can say if all of the gravitational rate, if all of the angular momentum was radiated as gravitational radiation, this is the strain it would take. So this is the spin down limit on H naught, the strain amplitude we'd like to quote, and it's about 10 to the minus 24. So if all of the spin down was going into gravitational waves, that's what, what you know, we would have, 10 to the minus 24, and that translates into almost 10 to the minus 3 in terms of ellipticity. Now, 
um, in, in the case of, in, in almost all pulsars, we have a spin down limit to compare to, and we know that um, the LIGO observations are nowhere near. There is actually another pulsar in this paper which is comparable to the spin down limit, J0537, which is interesting for other reasons, but we really need to beat the spin down limit by a bit to be interesting. If you look at the energetics of this nebula, this thing is spitting out particles like crazy, and it's glowing, and, and you say, okay, that, that accounts for some of the energy budget, and you want to beat this by something of order 1.2, and then more stringently, if you look at the breaking index, that's basically the second frequency derivative of this pulsar. It's one of the handful for which we know that number, and when you plug that number into a bunch of phenomenological simulations that Cristiano Paloma did a while back, um, um, who's now working with Virgo, um, in order to, to account for the observed second frequency derivative, or breaking index, we need to beat this number by a factor of 2.5. So the latest and greatest result, um, not this one, this was a fraction of S5, but the full LIGO S5 result is beating this by a factor of 7 in amplitude. So that's a factor of 50 in luminosity. That's saying less than 2% of the canonical spin-down energy um, it's, it's a bit fuzzy because of the moment of inertia, but even the conservative canonical estimate, 2% of the spin-down energy or less is going out in gravitational waves, and that's pretty interesting. Um, even with all of this extra stuff, from the extra constraints from the nebula and the breaking index, we're beating that by a pretty good bit. And this isn't just eye candy. This picture was also important because the pulsar wind nebula, you see there's sort of a torus and it jets coming out, and you, you can guess the inclination angle of that um, uh, of the axis of rotation of the neutron star from that, and that tells you something about polarizations which, which feeds into the gravitational wave search and gives you a better upper limit. So that's one of the things helping us out with beating it by that factor of seven. Um, now that factor of seven is coming from a search where you assume that the gravitational wave timing uh, drifts and wobbles around, you know, the gravitational wave frequency moves around in exactly the same way that the, the pulse frequency in radio and x-ray pulses and all that moves around. We also did a search um, you could imagine, because these things are observed to glitch every now and then, that is, the frequency will slowly drift down, 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 and then <coughs> boom, it jumps a bit, jumps up a bit, and, and the drift rate changes a little bit for a while, too. Um, um, when, you, when you look at the pulsar glitches and do a little numerology with the, the biggest glitches that have ever happened, you can say, okay, um, you know, we, th this looks like uh, there are two parts <coughs> of the neutron star gradually spinning a little bit out of sync with each other and then bam, coming back in together. And you can say, um, all right, um, if these two parts are a little out of sync over time and one of them is emitting the ENM radiation and the other is emitting the gravitational radiation, um, we can search an area around the timing solution that the pulsar astronomers give us. Uh, and there we, we got an answer. Um, you know, that was, that was Joe Betzweiser's thesis um, here, here in the front row. That, that, that search, uh, well, we, we didn't beat this thing by a factor of seven, but we, we basically beat it by a little bit. We beat the spin down limit over this wide parameter <coughs> by a little bit. And the, the hidden sensitivity came from the fact that, you know, you're looking over a big parameter space, so statistically there's more chances for the noise to jump up. You have to be stingier about detection of your you know, injections that determine your sensitivity. Um, there's also, so that was in the older paper, and in the newer paper, so, so the old paper, the first one on the crab, stopped at nine months into S5 because there was a glitch, and we, we, we didn't handle that at the time. The new paper includes, not only for the crab, but for a couple of other pulsars, including that other one that glitched six times during S5, it stitches across glitches in various ways. So you have these two timing connection, two timing solutions, that you can assume are either perfectly connected or jump around in various ways. And so there are several, you know, this number I'm quoting, of course, is the best number, beating the spin down limit by seven in amplitude. But there's several others with lesser sensitivity that are also interesting. Now in ellipticity, this factor of seven means that the, that the observational limit on ellipticity comes out to a nice even 10 to the minus four. And that is in the range that is possible for wacky quark stars, and maybe even getting close to what's possible for hybrid stars. I should say we have no idea, you know, the, the maximum ellipticity and the minimum ellipticity can be very different um, from looking at the internal, if you assume the internal magnetic field is the same as the external magnetic field, you can work out how much that should deform the star, and then it's like 10 to the minus 11 minimum. Um, but, if, but if you look at our, our ellipticity limit, um, since, since the 
the, the, the ellipticity due to an internal magnetic field deforming the star is quadratic, you can say um, using, well, here's the one we actually cited. This is the latest calculation in the long line of them. Um, this, this lets us put an upper limit on the internal magnetic field of 10 to the 16 Gauss. Now, how interesting is that? We have no idea because the people do a lot of work on magnetic field configurations completely static, but what you really want to know is the crab is a thousand years old. Um, you know, could we have had a 10 to the 16 or 10 to the 15 Gauss uh, field inside, which some people think forms in a lot of these things? Could it stay buried to the extent that the external field is only a few times 10 to the 12 Gauss for, for a thousand years? That's an interesting question that nobody's really looked at. Um, again, interesting opportunities coming out here. Um, basically, if, if you look at elastic stuff, the hydrostatic equilibrium tells you the, the number you're measuring, the ellipticity, is basically a product of three numbers, and an observational upper limit means that at least one of those numbers is small. It doesn't let you constrain any of them individually. Now, some theorists have gotten overexcited and have written papers saying LIGO is constraining the QCD phase diagram and stuff like that, and we don't put that in our papers because you just can't. Uh, you know, um, an upper, you know, if, if we found something with a huge mountain on it, that would indicate it wasn't the normal neutron star. But the upper limits, uh, because of this product thing, just don't tell you that. Um, they, could, they could tell us something, though, if we started looking at the population of things and had some idea what could drive a young star to its maximum ellipticity. That's a separate question from what is the maximum ellipticity. And, you know, you could even think, um, just postulating that there is such a mechanism, what could we say about that? Now, here is something I've got Richard O'Shaughnessy working on, um, who, uh, well, ba basically this is, this is a plot of um, arranging the observed um, spin frequencies and frequency derivatives of all the known pulsars out there. And um, normally people arrange this into, a, you know, assuming the spin down is all magnetic field, they arrange this into magnetic field versus characteristic age. You can arrange it into ellipticity versus characteristic age. And the black triangles are the spin down limits. Um, so that's what we already know from pulsars and whatnot. And the red crosses are what advanced LIGO can do with a run comparable in length to S5. And so do these numbers in your 10 to the minus 4 for the crab assume perfect electromagnetic coupling? In other words, the gravitational wave has the same frequency as the pulsar at all time? Um, these numbers, the emission is not much affected by that. So, so I'm assuming uh, the gravitational waves are two times the spin frequency. Right, but, and but it's a question of whether the core and the crust are right. Level, right, which was the factor of seven for the crash. So I was just wondering for right. these. So, so the little detuning is not going to affect the emission. What it does affect is if they're <coughs> detuned and we don't find them with a search that's tracking precisely, then we have to search that broader parameter right. space. And that'll that'll hurt us. So these, these red guys are assuming that we have a complete tuning, you know, we have a complete phase lock. And they're gonna move up, let's see, in, in the case of the crab. Um, it, they moved up by a factor of four, four-ish, because um, we, we searched a huge parameter space instead of phase locking. So the, you know, this one would move up to about here. This is the crab, by the way, this red one on the bottom left. Um, it, it, yeah, it would move up about a factor of four. This is a logarithmic scale, so it, it wouldn't tremendously change things. Um, so basically, you know, um, you, you could tell a story already based on the black ones on the spin down limits. You, you could tell a story that the electromagnetic <coughs> observations tell us if there is a mountain building mechanism in young neutron stars, um, it can push us up no higher than these lowest black, black symbols here, you know, about 10 to the minus 4, a few times 10 to the minus 5. And then, you know, if there is some mechanism and then it slumps away through vis you know, plastic flow or viscoelastic creep or whatever, then that happens on a time scale of order 10 to the 7, a few to at most, you know, what, whatever you put on there in the most optimistic scenario can only last a few 10 to the 7 years. Um, now, advanced LIGO, if it doesn't see anything, then you can say, um, you know, that, that number goes from 10 to minus 4 down to more like 10 to minus 6. And if it does see something, you know, the, the latest normal neutron star maximum ellipticities are around in here. So there's, there's a shot at it with something like half a dozen of these young pulsars if there's a phase locking between the electromagnetic and the gravitational wave signal. Now, the sensitivity is going to get worse, you know, if, 
like like you're saying, if we see nothing there, and you know, we have to account for a certain number of broader parameters mixed too. So, so I'm trying to understand. So, the initial LIGO got 10 to the minus four, and advanced LIGO is 10 times better. So, how do you do 100 times better? Uh, the noise curve doesn't just move down on this plot; it also moves to the left. The crab is pretty far down; it's 60 hertz okay, gravitational. So, it's, low, so it's, better it's a lot better than 10. It's like 40 or something. Yeah. So that's yeah. That's why we're moving, you know, almost two orders of magnitude instead of one. Um, okay, so um, another interesting neutron star to talk about then is the youngest known neutron star, the one sitting in supernova remnant Cass A, and this is one I, I yanked an Australian student into looking at. Um, well, here, here's what we see when we look at it electromagnetically. There's a little glowing dot in the middle of the supernova remnant. Um, there's no pulses and no pulsar wind nebula, so we don't know what frequency to look at. We don't know what timing to look at, and it's hard. We do know where to look at, thanks to Chandra, sub-arc second precision on you know, this, this thing sitting right there in the middle of the remnant. It's, it's pretty young. It's a factor of three younger than the crab, and um, it's less than a factor of two more distant. Uh, which you can get by doing numerology on all the glowing stuff flying out. And, well, what makes young neutron stars, you know, what, what can make you, young neutron stars lumpy? Well, again, we, you know, we don't really know. We have to sort of wave our hands around and hope for, you know, nasty things after the supernova being left behind, for example. But um, you could say, you know, maybe all things being equal, the youngest ones might be the lumpiest. And, um, and then, um, even independently of that, you can just put through energy conservation, basically by extending the spin-down limit, you can, you can put an indirect limit based on age, which tells you what things are interesting to look at. And lo and behold, Cas A, if you max out energy conservation given the age of the thing, could be around 10 to the minus 24 strains, similar to the spin-down limit for the crab. Now there's an additional caveat that you have to hope it's not spinning with a one second period for something crazy, which is way too low for LIGO to get. Um, but it's feasible, you know, we, we can't search the whole two years of data that's in the can, but we could search a couple of weeks pretty easily. And you can project the sensitivity um, where, you know, the, the LIGO paper is sort of inching its, inching its way to completion. Um, so, you know, you, you can project a sensitivity. Um, here, here's the indirect limit in red. It's the flat line. Um, strain versus frequency. Um, this is what we ought to be able to do. And so you can see we ought to be able to beat this energy conservation limit over a band from about 100 to 300 hertz. And those H's and those frequencies correspond to ellipticities in the range of a few, few times 10 to the minus 4 to a few times 10 to the minus 5. So that's not totally crazy either, at least if you believe in you know, quarks and hybrid phases and things like that. You can also, um, um, you can also I've, I've been thinking about this lately, um, you can also think about R modes. Now the old picture we were looking at, you know, 12 years ago when I when I was in this room or the next one defending my thesis was saying, okay, we we didn't we didn't know how big the modes could get, so we just threw up our hands and say, you know, in terms of some delta v over v amplitude, one is when nonlinear stuff will definitely come in, and uh, you know th things will saturate at some amplitude of one in some units, and then we'll go over in a year, which is pretty boring for things in our galaxy. They they don't happen that often. Super heavy, um, but there's a long line of stuff coming out of Cornell. The latest one um, here, these mode mode saturation couplings calculations, where people are looking at the nonlinear hydro um, and you know Saul and, and Ira Wasserman. Um, you know, the R modes could still be active in some scenarios uh, with an amplitude considerably lower than Unity. Um, now you have to you have to worry a little bit about. Um, You'll see when the CASA, when the LIGO paper comes out, I'll have a little companion paper. There's a little homework you have to do to verify that we can detect R modes with our data analysis pipelines, because they, they have this funny multipole structure. Um, but it works. We can still manage it. And you can calculate indirect limits, like spin down limit and, and whatnot, on, on R mode amplitude as well. Um, there's one caveat here. Um, when, you're, when we talk about an ellipticity, we talk about a constant ellipticity and it's just spinning around and making the sine wave. But with R modes, the amplitude of the R mode itself can jump around in funny ways because these mode networks, these nonlinear hydro calculations, they're incredibly complicated. There's lots of different regimes, but in most of the regimes, the R mode is not sitting there with a constant amplitude. It can sit there with an amplitude for a while and then jump up to another amplitude for a while or jump down or or do wacky 
modulation things. That, and so we're really measuring an RMS R mode amplitude and putting, um, you know, like energy conservation limits on that. And if you if you estimate what the the indirect limits I was showing on the previous slide correspond to in terms of R mode amplitudes, um, in terms of an amplitude we use, not the one Saul uses, um, the the spin down limit or the, the analog of the spin down limit can get you down to a few times ten to the minus three. That's about that's a few times ten to the minus four in terms of the amplitude you use. That's pretty close to this parametric instability threshold, so it's not totally crazy to think that something could be happening. Plus, you know, you can have runaways and other other wacky things where the the the, the amplitude could get bigger for a while. So we ought to be able. Um, that's right. I I, I can't. The, the, there, there isn't, there isn't a result, a result out there yet, but you'll, you'll see before too long. You know, um, you can project that we ought to be able to get to interesting sensitivity on our modes for Cassay, and not just Cassay. There's a bunch of other interesting young neutron stars people are looking at, um, and we have plans for more. Okay, so my last, my last neutron star that I wanted to talk about, switching topics again. Um, so the, the, the Crab Pulsar and the other pulsars that we were talking about, and Cas A and the other uh, young neutron stars um, that I was talking about just on that last slide, couple of slides, um, those are not accreting matter from a companion. Now accretion changes the game completely, because um, there's now ways of generating asymmetry. Um, well, the R modes are a way of generating asymmetry. They generate their own asymmetry in the young neutron star, but they're, they're trickier for various reasons. Here, you could even make mountains in different ways, and there's sort of interesting observational arguments as, as to why this should be happening. There's this torque balance scenario. It, it, it actually goes in some ancestral form back to the 1970s. Um, there's, there's this funny fact that when you, when you look at the accreting neutron stars, and we know a couple hundred of them, um, you know, you, 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 you look at these things, you can infer the accretion rates from the x-rays, and even over a huge range of accretion rates, the spin frequencies are not, not varying as much as you would think, and the spin frequencies are not as high as you, th you would think. And it looks like um, Lars, was, Lars Bilston was the one a dozen years ago who really put this on a really firm footing. Um, you know, it, it looks like you know, there's, a, there's, a net, there's something holding them up at a certain frequency. Gravitational radiation goes pretty steeply with frequency, and so that, that's, a, that's a good candidate. And Lars figured out that there's a natural way if stuff is spilling down onto a neutron star from the, uh, from the accretion disk over here, that it'll, it'll, it'll heat this part of the star, and the electron capture layers that form the structure of the neutron star, this onion-like structure, they'll get puffed up, and that'll be a natural way of generating asymmetry. Um, there are also other things you can do, like, um, well, it's, it's Andrew Milatos and his gang with a big industry of writing papers on funneling accreted stuff onto the magnetic poles, although it was, you know, it was really, you know, Stirl put him onto this when, when he was a postdoc here. Um, and then R modes can pop up again in this context. Accretion through a very complicated chain of physics I don't have time to go into can actually keep those things alive well beyond what's going on in the young neutron star. Um, now, when you look at accreting objects, I'm, I'm working with Andrew Milatos. Um, the, the, main, the main thing I was doing for the previous half of my sabbatical, when I wasn't here, I was at Max Planck in Hanover. I was working with um, the gang there and Andrew and one of his students, showing her how to do a realistic search for an accreting neutron star. The one you want to look at is SCOX1, because it has the highest X-ray flux, and the indirect limit you can infer on gravitational wave strain corresponds to that. Um, now there's a lot of papers out there, um, like you know, Kip, for example, would write all these review articles saying this is easily detectable with advanced LIGO, and that's because Kip likes to be optimistic, and um, and indeed in those days um, you, you could be optimistic that we were going to find the spin frequency on SCOX1 and be able to track its spin phase and everything precisely, um, and so you could use the sensitivity factor for targeted searches for pulsars. Um, which are much more sensitive, you know, than when you don't know what's going on. But unfortunately, we still don't know what's going on. Ever since, you know, the, you know, early '90s when Kip was writing these reviews, people have been searching the X-ray data harder and harder and harder, and they haven't managed to find it. Um, so what what we're thinking of is in terms of not knowing that spin frequency, but you know, may, maybe you know, may, maybe knowing um, the orbit, which is a bit more feasible. Um, if, if you look at the searches you can do over a wide band and sort of realistic use of um, computing time, um, 
Um, I, basically, um, the, the scenario over here is amplitude versus frequency. Um, this is kind of a dense plot. There are several scenarios. These straight lines are different scenarios for what the, what the source could be doing. The bottom one is sort of the conservative normal one, but if you think about various wacky things that might happen with the star structure and the way it's funneling stuff in the accretion disk in the magnetosphere, you could, you could push H up by a factor of two or two point something. Um, the, the, the most feasible search, the, the, the search, we, we call it the comb over because it uses the frequency comb that radio astronomers use over a wide band. Um, if that's sort of an esoteric way of handling the uncertainty in orbital parameters. Um, the important thing is this is a feasible search that Letizia has actually you know, run on simulated data and it's really doable, it scales nicely, it doesn't kill, you, you could run it with four days of computing time in the Hanover cluster and it will get a sensitivity something like this with advanced LIGO and counting Virgo in there too as basically a, a fourth LIGO. Um, you, you see that the with the information we've got um, using this frequency comb search, you can only get you, you can only um, get this thing um, up to a gravitational wave frequency around 400 hertz, and we believe it's probably higher than that. So you really want to be able to search to higher frequencies. Where unfortunately the indirect limit on gravitational wave frequency goes down. Now, if if you th if you think about okay, people have been searching for the spin for ages, and that's hard, but people have gotten the orbital parameters roughly. If they go back and track the orbital parameters more precisely, and I'm very happy to say Duncan Galloway in Australia is now talking about doing precisely that. He's got a little seed money. He's, he's trying to get more to go do this. Um, this this would really help. You know, you you can't see the neutron star, but you can see the companion. Um, uh, what is it? V eight V eight eighteen SCO uh, optically, and you and you can track the orbital a little more precisely. We can demodulate that completely and get a sensitivity corresponding to this blue curve the middle of the funny curves, and you can see that crosses the line for what the source could possibly be doing up around eight or 900 hertz, which is much more interesting. And then down here is just, you know, if we did get the frequency and the full timing solution like Kip was hoping we would get, you know, 15 or 20 years ago, then we could do like this and get it across the whole LIGO band, essentially. That, that would be great. Um, that you can push this up by a factor you, factor of two or so looking at different scenarios. Um, one assumption that I put into these curves is that the spin frequency, the central spin frequency is not wandering. The torque is perfectly balanced. Um, as people have argued it should be, um, well the argument is really torque balance in the long term over thousands of years and the question is does that happen instant by instant. If it does and the spin is perfectly constant, we can get that sensitivity, but if the spin wanders around, and you can see that it takes you know on the order of ten or twenty days, um, you know as the accretion rate fluctuates, um, and so you know torque is balanced over the last million or thousand years, but not not week by week. Um, then we have to search a bigger parameter space, and we're going to lose something like a factor of close to three, um, two point something. On the other hand, um, SCOX one is shooting out these radio jets that look like you know they're coming they're being squirted out from an accretion disk now if you read all the papers people talk about those radio jets as being the orbital angular momentum axis of the binary but I, I you know you could also argue I don't think anybody's done this in print you know look if these things are squirting out from the accretion disk they should be tracking the spin axis of the star and then that lets us play the game we talked about with the crab of putting that in you know, that affects the polarization of the waveforms and you can put that into the search and that'll gain you back most of that factor of 2.7 from having to search a bigger parameter space. So these curves are roughly the right sort of thing. Um, so what we learn, you know, if we see this thing, it's really neat. Um, some, some, something important I didn't mention, so for the accreting neutron stars, I, I didn't say this explicitly, so there are all these ways of generating asymmetry, and the torque balance argument gives you a good argument why you know, the indirect limit on gravitational wave emission is actually the strength that you're getting out of these things. Now for the crab, you know, the spin down limit is 10 to the minus 24 in H, but it could be easily radiating at 10 to the minus 30 and we'd never see it. Whereas with these guys, there's lots of good reasons they should be driven up as far as they can go. Um, and so, you know, that curve really is probably pretty close with their radiator. <coughs> That's the torque balance argument, and if we see that, that confirms it. 
and you know it can maybe tell us some other things about accretion if we're um, if we're able to distinguish between these different possible curves, um, and also you know if if we, if we talk about the spin wandering every couple of weeks versus the spin staying perfectly fixed all the time, the torque balance happens very fast. If it happens very fast, it has to be an emission mechanism that responds very fast, like an R mode, and if if it moves around as the accretion rate varies, then you're looking at something buried deep in the crust that's feeling the last, you know, long time scale average. Um, we, we can tell, um, you know, basically if, if we find gravitational waves from SCOX1, we can narrow it down, <coughs> we, can, we can tell the astronomers to, to narrow down um, what frequencies they're gonna look at for, for uh, X-ray pulses or, or what have you. And, and that could help them with a bit with, with their search problem. And, it, and if they do identify the spin frequency, depending where you find it, if it's a ratio of, you know, if the gravitational wave frequency is twice the spin frequency, or if it's four thirds, you know, that also tells you if the emission mechanism is a static ellipticity <coughs> or an oscillating R mode. So there's all, all kinds of neat stuff we could get out of that. Um, okay, so I'm up to my hour now. So the takeaway points I wanted to leave you with are just that, um, in, in, in spite of the fact that, you know, I, I, would, I, would, I would bet pretty good money actually that people are right that binary mergers are, are most interesting in the long term because they're safe, they're guaranteed to happen. The magnetar flares and continuous waves, the wacky stuff that uh, we weren't thinking so much about, those are already interesting with data we have in the can, even with upper limits. We're starting to do little nibbles of astronomy here and there. Um, and they relate to a lot of more neutron star physics than just the equation of state. Um, there are ways of reading equation of state off of tidal disruption and things like that, but here we can look into crystallography and all sorts of things. And the, the really neat part of this is, is every time I start trying to cobble together my notes on, on what's been done lately, it's a never-ending series of, you know, there's a lot more interesting questions being opened up than answered. Uh, not, just, you know, not just in observation, but in the you know, theory and the all-important interface between theory and observation. So there's, there's a lot of neat stuff to look at here. Thank you for your attention. So why don't we take one good question before going to refreshments? Next one. Or in these, in these types of uh, searches that aren't, if you look at the delta F over F, presumably they're not narrow like a, millisecond pulsar. Do you have templates or could These. you use a cross correlation technique between our multiple and the parameters? Uh, so which which the, 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 the known pulsars? Like the SCO X1. SCO X1. SCO X1. SCO X1. Um, well, we really don't know what the spin of SCO X1 is at all, so we'd want to search over you know hundreds of hertz band. Um, I I don't know about the mechanics of combining combining different low-mass X-ray binaries, combining SCOX1 with other neutron stars. I don't know what that would be data analysis-wise, but I suspect it wouldn't be worth it because in, in order for those combinations to work, it's like adding resistors in parallel. You're dominated by the best one unless you have two of them that are comparable, and there's nothing even close to SCOX1. It's in multiple interferometers, cross-correlating like you do with the stochastic background search. Ah, okay. Multiple interferometers. Um, so the, the cross-correlation search is, that is something that you could use to look at that. So we did have that, we did have that paper where it was sort of thrown as an, as an afterthought to a stochastic background search. Um, I did sort of eyeball this at one point, and it's a, it's a bit tricky to calculate, but I think, I think for, for short integrations, you know, meaning if you're looking at uh, comparable to S3 or S4, uh, like a, a month worth of data, cross-correlation and the frequency cone thing are sort of comparable, but the frequency cone is gonna win in the end because apart from the orbit, which it has to live with some uncertainty, and it's doing that step incoherently, um, adding the power in different frequency bends to catch the orbit, the frequency cone is fully coherent, so you gain as the square root of integration time. So you go up to two years, you win over cross-correlation, which only gains as the fourth root of of integration time because it's semi coherent. Because we have short f box over which you do the cross correlation. Yeah, yeah. You're you're limited 
you're limited by the orbital time scale, and then when you go beyond that, you're combining incoherent stretches of 19 hours, and so you get t to the one fourth instead of t to the one half. So I don't, I haven't actually worked out at what point the comb starts beating cross correlation, but for for the long ones, it should. Great. I think Ben can entertain more questions. So why?